All right, so for today's notes, again, I'm recording this on Friday, so hopefully I'm not going to talk too, too fast in this. Um, this video should not be as long as the last one. So you should have been given this back so that we can fill in the rest of these, plus this page, and you're probably like, oh my gosh, that's a lot. But again, we're only doing some amendments at each time. So for today, I want you to listen very carefully to me. You see the ones that say Civil War Amendments, 13th, 14th, and 15th? Those can go in the trash. Not because they're trash, but because that's not the time period we are at right now. Those amendments to the Constitution came about 60 years after where we are and what we're talking about in social studies. So I want to save these guys for a later date. So for today, they're going to go in the trash can and I can just give you another copy. I don't want to have to stress you out about saving it. All right, so that leaves us with these. And I'm going to cut out this one that kind of looks like a tombstone, in my opinion. It's kind of weird. That's okay. That's the ninth and tenth. There they are. You can see they make a fun little foldable. And then this one that looks like a flower is interesting. I've got to do some precision cutting here. And I am not very good at that. It's a pretty looking flower though. Oh, not after I've finished cutting it. So I am trying to think of a question today and based on the last video, I've had some ideas of what that could be. So you might be suspicious about what I'm gonna ask. All right, what do I do with my glue stick? What do I do with my glue stick? Probably, yep, put it right here. So I am gonna paste both of these down but today we're only going to do some of them. So I'm going to put the glue on the back of the limited government amendments part. That'll allow me to flip those two bottom ones up without issue. And I guess what we'll do is we'll just um, paste under this pentagon here. And what we'll do just for simplicity's sake is just write underneath like this. So we'll just flip it up and write underneath of it as we need to. All right. Let's pick up where we left off on the branches though. So let's find this one because this is going to be the most time consuming one and then I'll see how many amendments we get to. Not a big deal if we don't get to as many as I planned. All right, as a reminder, we have three branches of government. You have heard this before. We have the legislative, um, and we have this at both the state level and the national level. So um, our legislature at the national level, the one that's in Washington, D.C., is called our Congress. It's made up of the Senate and the House of Representatives, and their job is to make our laws. At the executive level, the executive branch in Washington, D.C. We have our president and his advisors, which are called his cabinet, and their job is to carry out the laws, to enforce them, to make sure that the laws these guys passed are followed through on. And then we have our judicial branch. Again, we have it at the state and um, national level. The national level, we're talking the Supreme Court and some lower courts. Their jobs are basically to interpret these laws um, and settle conflicts so that if this uh, these guys pass a law that these guys say conflict with the um, Constitution, that law is thrown out. So they're checking each other's power. Nobody has all the power. It's shared. This was the idea of somebody. Montesquieu. I wonder where he was from. Okay, let's keep going. How are members selected? For the legislature, the people elect representatives. 
Now, a representative is somebody who acts on behalf of someone else. You see, if we made the laws ourselves, if we dealt with all that the Congress deals with, that's all we would ever have time for. We wouldn't have time for anything else in the world. So we elect these people to do the job of governing on our behalf. They're our representatives. They're representing us in Washington, D.C. Um, the House representatives, the people who go to the House of Representatives, they serve for two years, and then they're up for election again. Um, an election is great because if you don't like the job that that particular individual is doing, you can vote for someone else. Senators, however, serve a little bit longer. They serve for six years, and after those six years, they're up for election again. Doing a good job, you vote for them again. You disagree, you vote for someone else. The executive branch. The people do vote for the president. However, he or she is elected by the electoral college. That should be capitalized. That E is in a word that is a proper noun. Miss Brinson, get it right. Um, the cabinet, the advisors who help the president make his decisions are appointed. That means suggested by the president. He picks them. However, they have to be approved by the Senate. The Senate confirms them. So again, that's that check on power. Yes, he picks, he or she picks them, his, his or her advisors, but the Senate has to agree um, with those decisions. Judges are appointed by the president. Again, he's picking them. And then confirmed by the Senate. The Senate has to give their stamp of approval on these advisors for the president and these judges. So again, the power is not all in one person's hands. It's shared. They serve for life. So unlike these that have elections, these, these ones do not. How is it organized? Congress, this column here, has two houses. We just said that. The Senate and the House of Representatives. Each state has two senators. Um, when you turn 18 and you go to the polling booth, you will vote for your senators. The House of Representatives, this number is determined by the population in each state. So states that have higher numbers of people have more representatives in the House of Representatives. North Carolina has a pretty large population, so we have quite a few representatives. However, this is important for you to know, you will only vote for a representative for your area. You will not vote for all the representatives for North Carolina. There's one representative who represents Pamlico County and the surrounding areas, and that's the representative we vote for on Election Day every two years. The president, moving on to the executive branch, is given advice by his or her cabinet. Right, I already said this stuff, so we'll say it again. Um, conflicts about national laws, so those laws that are passed by these guys, right? Begin in lower court, possible, um, and decisions can be appealed. This is very complicated stuff that I don't want to get too, too into. Um, so basically, if these lower courts can't solve the dilemma and it gets appealed, so the people involved are like, yeah, we don't like this decision. We want someone else to look at it. It's going to move its way up the chain of command and ultimately can reach the Supreme Court, which is the highest court in the land.
what power does it have over laws? Not going to spend a lot of time on that. Just know there's a lot of courts and that there's a hierarchy that you have some courts that are um, dealing with it first. And if no resolution can be had, then it's going to go to another level. And it's just going to keep going up like you're moving up in management, so to speak. First, you deal with someone who's just a regular worker. But if they can't solve your problem, you take it to their boss and so on. Similar, not exactly, a similar idea. What power does it have over laws? Congress proposes, that means they suggest, I believe that's been a vocabulary word this year too. Congress proposes and passes laws. So they come up with the idea of a law and then they pass it. They say, yes, this is going to be a law. Then the president is going to enforce this law. And so he can get the law and be like, uh, no, I'm not signing this law into effect. So then the president can veto it. That means, uh-uh, no. Mm -mm. Or pass the bill into law. So either it pretty much goes with a yes on the law or a no on the law. Um, however, the judicial branch can step in if they find this law violates the Constitution and therefore our rights as American citizens, it can declare a law unconstitutional. That is an L at the end. It just cut off onto this black border strip here. What other powers does it have? Congress has many other powers including, here we go, here's a list, a laundry list, which when we're writing, we want to avoid, right? Collecting taxes, not fun. They have the power to declare war. They have the power to control trade with other countries. Trade is important. We've talked about before how some places um, might have something and that we don't and we need access to those items so we trade what we have for what they have um, and they want to trade with us because we have things that they don't have. So it works out. Everybody benefits, hopefully. Um, the president is also the commander-in-chief. I bet you have heard of that. That means that they are um, the head person of the military. He or she also signs treaties and appoints government officials. Um, signing treaties, that would be like, um, not just necessarily over war, but you can make agreements with other countries and they say, yes, we're going to do these things for each other. Um, and that's a treaty. The president would sign that treaty. That is an S. Okay. We're going to move on then. Uh, if you need to pause this, please do so. We're going to move on then to whatever amendments we can get done in the remaining time. So go ahead and grab your flower amendment foldable, foldable and the one that, um, I don't know, looks like a door as well, like a door with a canopy. Okay. Due process amendments. What does due process mean? Due process means that the government must follow its own rules, its own laws that you have rights and that they cannot infringe upon those rights. They cannot violate your rights. It's not above its own laws. Again, this is a radical idea for the time. At the time you had rulers with just one person in complete control and that, that monarch, for example, or that emperor could 
do as he pleases or as she pleases. Um, it, it, they didn't have to respect that you had rights. And in a lot of those places, you wouldn't have had rights. This is very blurry. I wonder if I can find something that's better. All right. Let's start with, we left off with three. So we're on four. The Fourth Amendment. This one is no search and seizure. And this is not seizure like the medical seizure. This means to seize something, to take it. To take it without the other person's consent. Let's see, where do they want? Aha, this is the one. So under our little flappy, we're going to write the government must have a specific reason. They must be justified to search or take away. Remember, seizure, seize means to take a person's property. So you have a right to your stuff. And it's yours. And the government doesn't have a right to just come in and take it or search through it. This reminds me of A Night Divided, right? What did we see the Stasi do? They didn't have Gerda and Mama's consent or Fritz's consent. They just went into their house and searched through it and damaged it. Um, this would, if that were the United States, it would violate our Fourth Amendment, our right to not having our property searched or seized without a real reason. Like if um, there are reasons that the government might have to do these things for the protection of everyone else, but they would have to go to a court and get the court to approve this. They can't just do it without the court's permission. So again, check on powers. You can't just, it's not just one person making all the decisions. All right, we're going to do one more. Fifth Amendment. Move the little flower. Okay. If you need to pause it, do so. But I'm going to rotate the flower here to the Fifth Amendment. Jeez, this is not working out. This is the self incrimination. I'm going to explain what that means. Self-incrimination. And what this means, we're going to write underneath of it, is a person, meaning you or me, okay, does not have to give evidence, even if there is evidence that you have, let's just say there's evidence and you have it, you do not have to give it if it would make you be found guilty in a court of law. Um, so you don't have to basically turn over things that are going to get cause you to be punished. Um, where am I at? That would make him or her guilty. All right, I do have a secret um, word or question. I am going to put it here at the end because the computer is being difficult, not letting me insert stuff in the middle of the video for some reason. Um, so I want you to think about Montesquieu, the guy who came up with this idea of sharing the power distributing the power so that's not concentrated in the one person's hands. What country did he come from? Write that somewhere on 
your three branches of government notes, not these, not your amendments, but this one, right? Because he's the three branches guy. I call him Montesquieu the three branches guy. He's the guy who came up with this concept of making power be split up and not held in one person's hands. So it makes sense to put it with the notes that go with it. What country was Montesquieu from? Write that somewhere on this sheet. Make sure your name is on it. Put it in the basket. Once again, this video is top 20 minutes, and I am so, so, so sorry. All right. Thank you very much.